I would like for you all to imagine that you've been diagnosed with a serious genetic disease called hereditary angioedema. Like most people who are diagnosed with this, you've probably never heard of it, and that's because it's pretty rare. It affects about one in 50,000 or so in the United States. Unfortunately, if you are diagnosed with this, it's gonna make a major dent in your lifestyle. This is a picture, or these are pictures, of patients who have this condition. The condition is characterized by sudden, unpredictable attacks of swelling in different parts of the body. Sometimes it's in the limb, sometimes it's in the face, sometimes it's in the neck. If it's in the neck, it can actually kill a patient. In fact, about 20% of individuals who have the disease end up dying before their 20th birthday because of this. And you might think, you know, some, similar to, to allergic reactions, maybe you could take an EpiPen. EpiPens don't work for this. In fact, the standard of care uh, involves chronic prophylactic treatments, but even with that, most patients have breakthrough attacks and live in constant fear uh, that something like this could happen. Now imagine you have this condition and your doctor tells you about a potentially new treatment that could cure you of this condition based on something called CRISPR gene editing. I'm guessing many of you in the room have heard about CRISPR. CRISPR has revolutionized our approach to thinking about genetic disease and to think about the ability to treat these diseases at the root cause at the, gen at the genetic level. Uh, back in 2020, uh, CRISPR was uh, recognized uh, as with a Nobel Prize for the discoverers of this technology, and it's really revolutionized our approach because it enables us to get, uh, to, rather than treating the symptoms of disease, to get at that root cause. So, um, uh, so amazingly for HAE, uh, there is a condition, there's an approach to treating the condition that involves uh, a simple or straightforward gene knockout in the liver targeting a gene called calocrine. Uh, calocrine is really critically important for the swelling pathway, but it's not important uh, for uh, normal function. So we can get rid of it and the patients are, are okay. So again, imagine that you have this condition and that you take this chance and enroll in this clinical trial. What happens? Well, you'd come into a treatment center, uh, you'd be hooked up to an IV and re you'd receive an infusion. Over the course of that infusion, the treatment would uh, course through your bloodstream, get taken up by the liver, and edit the calocrine gene. Shortly thereafter, the protein in your blood would start to fall, the calocrine protein, and over the course of about four weeks, uh, you'd have up to a 95% reduction in your calocrine level, well below the pre uh, predicted therapeutic threshold. More importantly, uh, as, the, as the time progresses post-treatment, you would start to notice a decrease in the attacks that you're having. Uh, and after about four weeks, uh, uh, you'd start to see those attacks decreasing. After about four months, uh, most likely you would not have any more attacks at all. And this is even after decreasing or stopping uh, the prophylactic treatments that you've used your whole, you've, since you've been diagnosed. Uh, so this is incredibly exciting. Uh, this data uh, was generated by the company that I work for. I should make a caveat that I'm not here on behalf of my company. Uh, everything I'm saying tonight is really my own thoughts. But it's just really exciting for the field that this is uh, all from something that was discovered about 10 years ago, and it already has the potential of curing patients of some pretty horrible diseases. Now I'm going to tell you about a different disease. This disease is called primary hyperoxaluria. It's another bad one. It's caused, again, by mutations in a single gene, and in this case, it leads to elevated oxalate levels in patients. Oxalate pairs up with calcium and forms kidney stones, but in this case, because the oxalate levels are so high, it doesn't stop there. It actually calcifies the kidneys entirely. What's shown here is a CAT scan of a patient with this condition. And normally, you wouldn't see the kidneys on a CAT scan. But what you can see here is that the kidneys look just like the bone. They have the same density on, on the CAT scan. And so this condition, similarly to HAE, could be treated with a single uh, gene edit in the liver. And yet, no clinical trials are underway for treating primary hyperoxaluria with CRISPR. Why is that? Well, it turns out that primary hyperoxaluria is even more rare than, uh, than hereditary angioedema. Uh, in fact, it's so rare that uh, it's felt to be too rare for, for drug companies to go after it using once and done therapies like CRISPR. So what is it when we say a, drug, a, a disease is rare? Well, in the US, there's a specific regulatory definition of a rare disease, which means any disease that affects less than 200,000 individuals. But I can tell you that the vast majority of rare diseases affect far fewer patients than that, usually tens or hundreds of patients. And there are many, many such diseases. In fact, there's over 7,000 uh, rare diseases recognized. Over 90% of those have no FDA-approved treatment. So you can see there's a huge unmet medical need here. 
Why is it so hard for us to develop drugs for these super rare diseases? One thing that you have to understand about drug development is that our entire system for developing drugs has been based on uh, thinking about diseases that affect millions of patients rather than, again, tens or hundreds. More than that, the, the, the premise is that one drug is developed to treat one disease and that we don't leverage the learnings from one drug uh, at, to develop the next drug, even if those two drugs are very similar. So you're basically starting from scratch each time you're developing a drug. This, is inc this leads to an incredible, incredibly slow and expensive drug development process, whether that's for a common disease or a rare genetic disease. The problem with rare diseases, of course, is that they're rare, so there's very few patients to treat, ultimately, when you make a drug. So it's very difficult to, uh, to sort of, um, as a drug company, recoup the investment that you're making in developing a drug. Even more challenging in, in the world of CRISPR is that most of these uh, drugs would be a one-time therapy, such that the patients that you've treated in the trial, if the trial goes well, won't actually need the therapy once it's approved. So again, this is, this is a challenge that we're facing, in part because of how we develop drugs. And if we're smart enough to figure out how to edit the genome, we can certainly figure out how to solve this problem. Uh, so really what it comes down to is we, we need to innovate how we, do, how we develop drugs. And we need to think creatively, especially leveraging some of the strengths that we have here. So uh, what I've mentioned is that uh, this, this gene editing approach that we're taking is largely a platform-based approach with very small changes between uh, different, different edits within the genome. So we need to figure out ways of leveraging that to expedite this process. As an analogy, I'd like you to think about rockets. Uh, on the left, you can see a traditional rocket by NASA, the Artemis rocket. This is an amazing feat of human engineering and will probably take us back to the moon and perhaps beyond, but it's also incredibly expensive and time consuming to build these rockets, and they only get to be used once. On the right is, is the, spaceship, is, is the uh, SpaceX Starship, and the premise of this is that this technology could be reused so that while the first launch is probably equally expensive, subsequent launches are incredibly cheap, only about $2 million per launch. And it can happen, these launches can happen very quickly. So if you're thinking about launching a whole bunch of satellites, uh, rather than developing a new rocket each time, if you can reuse the platform, you can drive down the cost and, and the time considerably. With CRISPR, we can do the same thing. Again, leveraging the, the platform nature of the technology we can figure out ways of streamlining the drug development process. How would this work in practice? Well, as I mentioned two examples of a gene knockout in the liver. And again, the only thing that really differs between these two is about a 20 nucleotide region of RNA that constitutes the guide, which tells the CRISPR where to cut in the genome. That's it. Everything else about the technology is the same. So what we could do is figure out a way of leveraging that uh, to decrease the, the time and the cost to develop the drugs. So the first approach would be to first validate the platform in a more traditional regulatory framework, again, probably in a disease that uh, has enough patients where you could uh, have a uh, commercially viable uh, and successful drug developed, but then you would leverage that platform and figure out ways of uh, de-risking only the things that have changed between that platform, uh, between that first drug and the second drug. Of course, before taking this into the patients, you would de-risk as much as you possibly could, uh, especially in, in, in vitro, but you would cautiously move into patients and you'd make sure that the risk of the treatment is less than the risk of no treatment or of the standard of care. Of course, uh, full approval would still require uh, you know, clinical outcomes and real-world evidence, and that would come with time, but you could potentially get uh, conditional approval based on biomarkers, again, to try to expedite treatments. This is not an entirely new concept. In fact, the flu vaccine every year is approved with a very similar approach. The only thing that really gets evaluated from year to year is what's different in the, in the, in the therapy, in this case, the vaccine. Uh, it's not that uh, we have to go back to square one and, and start from scratch, uh, which is, again, a great, uh, great example of how we could potentially apply this more broadly. And this is not to say that there would not be risk in doing so. In fact, um, there's always going to be risk associated with, with uh, this approach. However, we have to acknowledge that, um, that if we're really trying to uh, treat everyone who has a rare genetic disease, we may not be, be able to de-risk every last uh, part of these therapies. So 
there is some good news that the regulatory agencies are starting to think along these lines. In fact, the FDA just this year announced uh, the uh, initiation of a new platform technologies uh, pathway to try to expedite the development of, of therapies. And actually, this was originally uh, designed as a, uh, during COVID as a way to try to speed pandemic countermeasures. But the uh, smart folks at the agencies uh, determined that this could be applied more broadly, including to, uh, to gene editing type technologies. So it's, it's exciting to see that this is, uh, this is in the works, uh, and it's too early for us to really know how this will play out. One thing we do know is that time is short. In fact, this year has seen a surprisingly and worryingly large number of companies in the rare disease space either go out of business or give up on rare disease programs because they can't uh, figure out how to make ends meet, and they're running out of money and time. So, uh, this is, of course, not acceptable. We have a lot of patients, 7,000 different diseases, most of which don't have a treatment. Um, it's, we want to make sure that no one is, is denied a cure for this potentially transformative therapy because their disease is considered too rare. We've come so close, uh, we need to figure out a solution to this. So I just want to close with a quote from my friend and colleague, uh, Fyodor Ernov, who's a true gene editing pioneer. He's at the Innovative Genomics Institute at UC Berkeley. And he uh, had in his New York Times opinion piece this quote that, unless things change, we will never, uh, the millions of people who CRISPR could potentially benefit will never actually benefit from it. We must and we can build a world with CRISPR for all. Thank you for your attention.